I don't want us to spend too much time on critical race theory because the right wing is using that to get that animal part of the brains of white people in such a frantic that they believe Democrats somehow support this thing called critical race theory that's going to make all your beautiful white children think or believe or start hating themselves because you are made to believe that the sins of your fathers are your sins. It's nothing of the sort, and it's a lot deeper than that. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. What I want to do is have a definitive sort of discussion on it and leave it alone because talking critical race theory, what it does is it forgets that a lot of people are losing their apartments or losing their homes. It forgets that a lot of people are still earning, starving, and slave-owning, slave slave type wages. It, it also p- points out, it prevents us from seeing or prevent us from talking about all our brothers and sisters of all races and classes in Appalachia, in the ghettos, in the barrios, that are suffering, that critical race theory has in, in, in their immediacy nothing to do with their current condition. So they're using these offhand discussions to let folks forget the pains in their bellies, the hunger, the lack of, the lack of their own personal economies, the lack of their own wealth, the living paycheck to paycheck. The losing of all these things. They want you to forget that. So they get you riled up about teaching your most. And this is targeted to white people. Targeted to your white kids. Your white kids are going to be suffering. Because those Democrats, along with the people of color that support them. And those crazy white people who support them. Wants to make you feel like less. Don't buy it. Do not dear bye. Check this discussion out on Morning Joe this morning and it has a bit more to go, but this is important. Give me a definition of critical race theory because Mm. it is confusing to me and I think other people confuse it and sometimes it's like this catch-all. Teaching slavery and critical race theory, those aren't the same things, are they? Christopher, you first. Yeah, that's absolutely right. This is one of the biggest kind of misconceptions. You can teach about slavery, discrimination, and racism without using critical race theory. Uh, Critical race theory, in simple terms, is an academic discipline that holds that the United States uh, was founded on racism, white supremacy, and patriarchy, and that those forces are still at the root of our society today. Uh, Critically, critical race theory reformulates the old Marxist dichotomy of oppressor and oppressed, but it replaces the class categories of bourgeoisie and proletariat with the racial categories of white and black. And if you look at the academic literature, the critical race theorists aren't merely saying we should examine the history of racial inequality or racial injustice. They're saying things that are much deeper. They call into question the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. They call into question the First Amendment right to free speech. They oppose capitalism and and believe that a system of collectivism must be implemented in order to improve society. Uh, It's not a benign philosophy about teaching racism. Uh, It's a radical philosophy that's rooted in Marx. Marxism uh, and is frankly inappropriate as a pedagogical framework for teaching children. Critical race theory emerges within the context of law schools, uh, Joe, in response in particular to the Baki case, as folk are trying to think about the relationship between race, racism, and American law, right? The rule of law, questions of do equal, pro- equal access and due process. So there's this argument that we needed to expand outward, that we, in order to understand the way race functions within the law, we need to understand these other broader historical, social, and economic economic realities. And so there's this attempt to think about the U.S. in a very, very complex and nuanced way. And I think it's really important that your opening question actually reveals something. For for Christopher, and and if I could call you by your first name, you know, you've already stated very explicitly that this is not about the substance of critical race theory. This is about branding. You tweeted it, right? So this no. is this is an empty signifier to capture no. all of these things that, that so-called are unpopular for Americans. And so part of what I want to suggest, Joe, is not about whether or not we actually get critical race theory right. That's not actually the point that Christopher and his allies are actually engaged in. What we need to be asking is why are they doing this at this point? Why are they making these arguments at at this moment? Is capitalism, if you are a capitalist, does critical race theory suggest 
that you are racist and that capitalism is racist and we have to move beyond capitalism. Well, it, it certainly holds in. Let me be very clear. I'm not a critical race theory, but it certainly is under my understanding, right. with my understanding, it certainly holds the claim that capitalism has its beginnings right within the context of the transatlantic slave trade, not its beginnings, but it actually expands within the context of, of, the, of the transatlantic slave trade. So there is something called racial capitalism that involves right the idea that there are certain people who are disposable and to the extent to which they are disposable because of the color of their skin, it allows for the accumulation of, of surplus value. So that's a complex argument that is tethered to not just simply critical race theory, but critical legal studies, which is also a feature of American law schools that hasn't somehow uh, uh, you know, drawn the ire of Christopher uh, Rufo and, uh, and his allies and those folks. Uh, where they're teaching kindergarten children as young as kindergarten that whiteness uh, is the devil and attempts to lure people into it uh, with the promise of stolen land and stolen riches. Uh, that's a book that's being used in hundreds of schools. And people don't think that's right. People want to know where it comes from. People want to know what ideologies so, well, what, inform what, what, what? it. They're telling people that they should feel shame, guilt, and anguish uh, because of their inborn characteristics and traits. Uh, these are the kind of lessons that I've uncovered in dozens of schools. Part of what we have to do in this moment, Joe, and we've talked about this, is to confront the ugliness of who we are. And part of what I hear in these sorts of arguments is this sense in which that confrontation must be one where we're comfortable, where we feel good about right. who we are, who we are after we confront it. So in some ways, I get, let me, let me just, I'm, I'm, I'm scooting up in my chair, Joe, because I'm getting upset. Because we're mm -hmm. seeing right now in real time a reassertion of the lie very thing that keeps us from becoming a different America because we don't want to accept who we are. What wait, we've wait, done. Wait, wait, wait. Part of what I'm thinking is that if once you concede the initial claim that America in some ways comes into being in light of this extraordinarily uh, painful reality, the contradiction that is at the heart of our beginnings, once you concede that, the way in which you begin to think right. about American exceptionalism shifts, right? Because it's not this idea that we, we are wholly innocent, that we're absolved of our sins, right. that recognizing who we are somehow con condemns us to, to hell, as it were, right. that we're being bludgeoned by, by, by our sins and made to feel guilty. That's not what we're saying at all. But we're saying that you have to confront it in order to release us into a different future. I want to say this really quickly. This sort of argument, this sort of argument is happening right now, and I want us to link it to January 6th. I want us to link it to the attack on voting rights. This is in effect, in my view, Joe, an attempt to arrest substantive change in the country. And we give these folk the credit that they're giving, that they're making the arguments in good faith. And I don't think they are. And I'll say it to Christopher well, right to his face. I don't think this is a good faith argument, period. Okay. It's not a good faith argument, period. And I'm glad that he, that he got it. First of all, let's get one thing straight. Uh, it is okay. America, is America a racist country? Does America have laws that, that its racist past uh, still cre creates the problems that, that we have today? The categorical fact-based answer is yes. Are all Americans racist? The categorical fact-based answer is no. But again, the structures of this country was built on all these different things. The structures of this country was built honestly. The, uh, the, the uh, Rufo tries to say, oh, they're teaching our kids that we stole land. Yes, because that is what happened. We are teaching our kids that we treated other people wrongly. Yes, because that's what's happening. What has happened? And if you teach the wrongs, you don't repeat them. That's why we have history. Uh, is capitalism a racist structure the way it's implemented in America? Of course it is. The initiation of capitalism was the, what the doctor calls the disposability of certain people of a particular hue. The fact that you could have, okay, because you are black, you're a slave, that's an economic structure based on capital. You, Mr. Slave, was a piece of capital used to enrich another person not of your hue. So the argument has to be made that we can honestly say who we were, who we, the parts that we continue to be, 
And in knowing this and wanting to be virtuous and wanting to be exceptional with our virtues, be able to change. There is absolutely nothing wrong about that. Nobody who hasn't held slaves, nobody who hasn't killed natives, nobody who hasn't land needs to be preoccupied about that or feeling less than because of knowing the truth. What we don't want to do is have people do what they did on January 6th on a false pretense. Those were unedu those were good people and people are like better how can you call them good people? These were good uneducated people who were fighting for something not to make their lives better, but fighting for something to keep an enriched few maintaining chaos in this country to remain enriched as they, the ones who fought to create disruption, screwed us, including themselves, all. Let's get it, people. Let's get it. Let's work together. Let's unite the barrios, the ghettos, and Appalachia. Let's unite everybody against that institution that is maintaining the division. And Mr. Rufo, he is one of their mouthpieces to try to create dissension, chaos, and enmity between all these people. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.